Lovely. So a very big welcome to another episode of Leaders Link. As ever, fantastic to see some familiar faces and friends. I know a number of you who know Wendy, others who don't. Um, so big welcome to everybody. Great also to have people from around the world. Uh, we, we do manage to have a fantastically global circle on these calls. So really appreciate you all taking the time and space to be here. And above all, Wendy, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Happy to be here with all of you. So, so yes, yeah, so these conversations are really about spending time with leaders who are doing something exceptional in the world and have got something important to share, or many important things to share about some of the big challenges of, of, of the day. And uh, we all know, I think pretty much everywhere that each of us is sitting in the world right now, we are in the midst of a whole slew of different challenges and we can dive into that a little bit. Um, and I think one of the characteristics of all of that is this deep sense of a need for leadership and of a dearth of, of great leadership and thoughtful leadership to carry us through a time of incredible, I would say, sort of historical change at so many levels. Um, when I moved to New York, one of the great benefits that I hadn't fully anticipated were how many extraordinary leaders there are in, in New York in particular, people who combine an incredible kind of can-do ambition and vision and willingness to do things at scale with deeply thoughtful leadership and a commitment to social change. And one of the most important of those who kind of came into my life early on after I moved is Wendy. So Wendy Cop, thrilled to have you here. You, you're a real inspiration. We have these, these uh, kind of about three times a year, Wendy and um, Jacqueline Novogratz and I have, have a lunch together and we've done that from the earliest days and it's been a real source of energy and inspiration, particularly when things feel very tough. So real pleasure to have you with us and to be able to share a little bit about, about what you're doing. Um, and I think just to set the scene, because I, I, pretty much everybody here, I imagine, knows of Teach for America or Teach for Name Your Country. You're now in 50 plus countries around the world. But Maybe just in your own words, Wendy, just share a little bit about what you do and what Teach Ball is all about. And indeed, this is what you've built throughout your adult life, right? You came out of college and, and you started on this journey. So give us a little sense of yes. what you do in your own words. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and again, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all um, talking about such an important topic in terms of, you know, the leadership we need. Um, so... And, and yes, as Lindsay said, I got started in this journey 31 years ago, I guess, when I had graduated from college and had this big idea that we needed to channel the energy of our generation against um, the inequities in our country here in the United States. Um, and, and that led to the launch of, of Teach for America. And I really had my head down and was fully focused on the U.S. until maybe 15 years ago um, when I started meeting people from all over the world, starting with Shaheen Mistri, actually, um, and her friends, ultimately Anu Aga and others um, who are on this call, um, who were just determined that something similar needed to happen in their countries. And that's what led to the launch of Teach for All now you know, 13 years ago, um, and, and also what informed its design, you know, as a network of independent, locally-led organizations in now 53 countries and growing um, that, that share a common purpose, um, which we articulate as defining or developing collective leadership to ensure all children fulfill their potential. You know, what brings all of these organizations together is a commitment to addressing the fact that the circumstances of kids' birth predict their ultimate outcomes. Um, and we know that that is a very big and complex problem and one that no, no one thing will solve. I mean, more heroic teachers are important, but not sufficient. Like, ultimately, we'll need to develop leadership at every level of really around the whole ecosystem around children, you know, at every level of education and policy and, and really across other sectors as well, who are united by a commitment to ensuring that all kids have the education and support and opportunity um, 
you know, really to shape a better future for themselves and for all of us. Um, so that is, is the common pursuit. And, you know, across our network, we share an approach to cultivating that leadership. Um, so at a high level. Yeah. Great. And um, before we sort of dive into some more leadership questions, maybe give, pick a couple of different countries that you operate in and give people a sense of how you have to tailor what you do to the particular circumstances in, in different parts of the world and, and you know, what, what that looks like in practice. Well, we do share an approach, which is, as, as some of you know, um, around essentially, first of all, I and mean, in every country, um, you know, this is true. Like people are calling upon the most promising leaders in their countries, outstanding recent college graduates, young professionals and others to commit two years to teach in under-resourced communities. And they're investing a lot in their development, um, you know, during those two years in pursuit of really important immediate outcomes for the kids they work with, but also in pursuit of long-term effects, you know, working to develop the leadership we ultimately need. And what we've seen across these countries is that we've actually seen, and I, I'll get to your question in just a second, Lindsay, but we've seen such similar effects in terms of the impact that these teachers have during the two years, but also the impact on the teachers themselves. There's actually a new body of research um, being developed with studies from different countries around the world that show just the the incredible effects on the participants themselves and how similar they are from place to place in terms of everything from reducing bias and increasing these teachers sense of possibility and the potential of their kids and the families and communities that they work with to you know growing their understanding of the complexity and adaptive nature of the solutions um, to the problem and and this experience also completely shifts their priorities so they never leave the work and and so ultimately, these organizations also continue investing in the ongoing leadership of, of these teachers and leaders and alumni who end up, some of them staying in education, many of them actually, more than 70%, um, but others who are working in different parts of the system so that ultimately we can, can grow a collective force of folks who, not only through their own leadership, but through the leadership they're supporting and inspiring and their students and other teachers and others in their communities can work towards something different. So you can imagine every one of these network partners contextualizing that common approach. Um, you know, I think about Anse Poiti, which is Teach for Haiti in, in Creole, um, where, you know, a very inspiring local leader. I mean, all of these organizations are led by you know, local social entrepreneurs from their country. So a Haitian social entrepreneur, Nadine Paul DeRoli, um, you know, just developed a vision for adapting this in Haiti. And she decided to recruit kind of mixed cohorts of teachers. Um, so some, you know, it's, uh, you know, 80% of the 1% of Haitians who get college degrees leave the country, believe it or not, but she's recruited some of them to, to commit to, to teach in, in rural communities in Haiti, but has also recruited people who are already teaching in schools in Haiti, some of whom trained as lawyers and, and others, you know, from different backgrounds um, who have the same kind of leadership potential. And then she invests deeply in developing the leadership of those teacher leaders. Um, you know, that's just one of the many adaptations right. that we've seen across the network and that then other network partners are leveraging and bringing into their own programming. Yes, it's interesting. I'm looking at all the different folk here. Peter from Nigeria, big welcome to you in Lagos. People from Kenya, Uganda, Chicago, etc. And thinking of the very diverse circumstances in which I've met a number of the folk on, on the phone, often battling, you know, to, to help educate kids in, in really challenging circumstances. So let's, you and I are both sitting here in New York City. Um, US is in the news globally right now. Um, we are globally in the midst of this pandemic, which is showing up in different ways in, in different economies. We're globally in the midst of an incredible economic, a kind of unimaginable economic downturn. And now on top of that, we are dealing with a very long-term crisis that, that has really spiked 
in the form of, of civil unrest and uh, racism and police brutality and so forth. Our own streets here, we've, we've got the marks of, of the protests and in some cases riots that have, have happened you know, literally down our streets in the last days. Wendy, could, could you just speak a little bit um, to our global audience about what you think is going on right now here in the States and how it's showing up for you in your own work and some of the questions you're asking yourself mm. as a leader here? Mm. Um, yeah, it's such a huge question and, and this is clearly such an intense time. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, to start with the, the global, you know, and of course in our work, I mean, with 90% of the world's kids having been out of school. And of course, the most marginalized kids are the least likely to be in safe spaces, to have access to nutrition and, and even clean water in some cases, um, and certainly to have access to ongoing learning opportunities. And I think well before the, you know, horrific incidents and, and the somewhat inspiring demonstrations in the U.S. and now across the world, um, we were reflecting just so deeply on the fact that, you know, really this crisis was just exposing and, and exacerbating massively the inequities that we exist to address. And I think, you know, the pressure of that in terms of thinking about like both, you know, what can we do in this moment to mitigate the effects for the kids and families we're working with across our network and, and for other kids and families in those countries, but also just the reflection on like fundamentally, what do we need to do differently to get at the roots of these inequities? Um, and I think maybe that was just the broader context that led, you know, these particular, you know, incidents of racial violence to strike people all the more, um, you know, vividly. I mean, you know, we've obviously seen such a history of this in the United States and it's, um, it's just horrible that we're still here. Um, but there is something different, it feels, in this moment. And maybe it's just the context of, I mean, a world where we were all supposed to be supporting each other to get through a somewhat common challenge, but at the same time, we were already seeing the inequities in, in, in that and in the way this pandemic is playing itself out in communities. Um, and so I think the recent incidents, I mean, and, and the pursuing kind of collective, I don't know, step back and reflection in, in the face of them. I mean, I think it's just calling on all of us. I mean, certainly we're feeling this um, at Teach for All to step back and reflect on, you know, what more we need to be doing differently individually and organizationally and in our work as a network um, to really get at the, the true roots and the extent of the inequities that we're addressing. I mean, there's a piece of, there's so much of this that's so inherent in our work, you know, like our very theory of the problem that we're addressing is that actually there is, it, it isn't about one thing. It's not about just more heroic teachers and strong that actually we aren't providing kids the chance to fulfill their potential if we're not taking on ideology and that, that marginalizes kids of different backgrounds, if we're not tackling the inequities and other things that hold kids back. Um, but this is a moment that leads us all to realize we need to do still more to develop the leadership we need and also to ensure that all kids are getting the kind of education that enables them to grow up the deep understanding of the history of our world and the strengths of different cultures um, and a commitment to working across lines of difference to shape an equitable future. Um, so there are just so many questions that we're grappling with about everything from the ways inequity still plays itself out within our own organization to the question of what kind of education we're providing kids to the question of how we're developing the leadership we need to take these issues on in their full complexity. What have you seen from some of your um, teachers, your young teachers around the world in response? Presumably they've had to innovate for a start, right? Suddenly the classroom's not happening. Presumably they're like, more yeah. likely to be digital natives, but we haven't got an even spread yeah. of, of the necessary tools and, and online abilities. How have you seen, kind of bring to life some of yeah. how 
your young people have stepped up to lead as you know we've needed innovation yeah. to get us through this time I mean, I've been so inspired by the teachers and alumni educators and, and our network partners during this moment. Um, I guess, you know, when schools are shut down, all you have is innovative, creative, local leaders, you know, to get you through it. I mean, and so I think the importance of a really intentional effort to cultivate leadership capacity has has maybe never been so evident. I mean, it was almost like watching a wave around the world as in different points schools in a region would shut down and then the following week we would hear about such incredible work that the teachers in these organizations were going to to ensure first of all that their kids were just safe and had access to the basic services being provided and whatnot um, but then to make sure that they keep learning and then it would take one more week before the ministries would enlist these teachers in training other teachers creating the virtual school houses being the voices on the radio stations and the tv stations which are really the only way in many of these places that we're still reaching kids and and attempting to keep them learning um, so at I would just say this moment has really, I, I almost think we talk so much about the digital divide and of course it's very real, but what we've seen in this era is that the, the biggest divide is actually, do you have access to teachers who have the relationships with kids and families and are just driven to make sure that kids stay engaged and keep learning? And, and honestly, it's true in the highest tech environments and it's, it's, of course, extremely true in the lowest tech ones. And, and just to say a couple more things on that, I mean, we have a student leadership advisory council, and I was talking with them, 20 students from different countries, about how they've experienced this era. And it was so interesting to hear from one of the students is from Denmark, which is probably the most, I mean, technology rich place we have discovered, you know, I mean, every kid has a laptop and high speed access. And she was describing her class. She said, you know, a quarter of the kids came every day and fully engaged. A quarter never showed up. And the other quarters were like somewhere in the spectrum, you know, and she was saying, it's just so hard for kids to motivate themselves. And what we've learned in this era is that some teachers are there to teach content and some teachers are there to teach kids. And this era took teachers who are there to teach kids, like who would be able to you know, pull them into the sessions, build the sense of community, facilitate learning rather than just talking at the kids. Um, and I just thought that was so interesting coming from a student in the most you know, high tech environment, um, but certainly in the lowest tech situations. I mean, one, one example, we have a community of teachers who've been working to teach without the internet. I think it's like, I don't know, by now 2000 teachers strong from all over, I mean, four different languages, 10 different WhatsApp groups, um, and they're sharing strategies for how they're doing this. And one thing that's quite inspiring about this is that we've seen that even if kids just have access to pretty low bandwidth solutions like phones and data um, and can be reached by say WhatsApp or Messenger, we've seen teachers literally keep learning just completely going and reflecting that actually the kids are learning more in this moment because the technology has enabled them to first of all enable kids to go at their own pace like they can watch the videos as many times as they need to um, they get more differentiated feedback because they're sending in their assignments and the teachers are able to go back and forth with them um, and they're saying you know we're going to bring this in there's an incredible teacher in pakistan named rabia who has created this kind of WhatsApp school and said, you know, it, my kids are learning more than they were when they were all together, like 50 girls, I'm able to meet their individual needs and we'll never lose this. Like we'll always have the WhatsApp school, even when we are finally back together, which is also really important to be. Wonderful, Wendy. We'll open up in a, in a few minutes for questions from the audience, but just a couple more from, from me before we do that. So one of the things you speak about, you touched on at the beginning is, is this idea of collective leadership in an interconnected, interdependent world. And, and I remember talking to you as you took your own leadership and your board through the journey of defining what I would call an expanded vision for Teach For All that was, was not just about education, but was about you know, how education translates into leadership, the leadership of children, 
the leadership of the teachers that you equip as young adults who go on to do all sorts of things in, in life. Could you just speak to us a little bit about what you mean by collective leadership and why you think it's so vital uh, in the world yeah. today? Um, so I guess our own evolution on this really came from our own learning journey um, over time. Um, you know, I saw that, first of all, I, I learned, and this was really through, through my years at Teach for America, that the communities that had enough leadership could do anything. You know, it's sort of like you would think you faced an immovable barrier, but then realize like, actually, we can bring the whole thing into our control with enough leadership, meaning, um, yes, we need, you know, strong teachers and leaders and it, meaning for school principals and, and school system leaders, but they run into barriers if we don't have school board members who are deeply committed or, um, you know, union leaders who care about teachers and, and will also put kids first or social entrepreneurs who are taking on the gaps in the system. Like, ultimately, so we realized, okay, we need leadership across the whole ecosystem. Like, you know, we can't just take on a piece. Mm -hmm. of that. Um, then we realized, though, that if that leadership is not deeply reflective of the communities in which we're working and very inclusive of the people who themselves have experienced the inequities we're addressing, we won't orient our work in the right direction, we won't move at the right pace, um, and, and the work won't be sustainable. So we started realizing, okay, not only do we need leadership across the whole ecosystem, but that leadership needs to be very, very diverse. And, and ultimately then we also saw that even in communities that had a lot of leadership and very diverse leadership, you know, if those folks were working just in their own silos as individuals, it was like, you know, they're all pointing in different directions. Right. So we need to ensure that those leaders are making the space really to get to know each other and have the debates and the discussions and ultimately develop a shared vision and, and work together and collaboratively so that we can kind of speed up progress. So I guess to me, it means all of those things. Like we need right. collective leadership, like many individuals, a very diverse group of them and, and you know, a collective approach, like the space and relationships to take a collective approach. Right. So you've got to find people who will engage across the ecosystem, even even when there's real and difficult differences. I, I want to um, offer the chance to open up the conversation now, folks. So please would really welcome anybody who wants to put their hand up. You use the raised hand. You go into the participant section. Um, I'm getting that right, aren't I, Beth? You go into the participant section and there's a little hand sign and you, you raise your hand and then we're going to call upon you and gather up some questions. The first one, I knew he would jump in, I can see, is, is uh, David Levin. So David, please go for it. Others, please go into participants, raise your hand. We'd love to hear questions from, from different folks. But David, in the meantime, off you go. Hi Wendy, really great to see you and, and you know, thanks so much for all that you're doing. Um, I, I had a question about the, the standing and status of teachers and teaching. Um, you've done an amazing job over this 25 years in elevating um, the, 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 the nature of teachers and, and building up uh, the, the appreciation for teachers. And yet the country around you or many of the countries around you have lagged. Do you think that in this lockdown crisis, when parents have suddenly faced the grim reality, um, um, th there's any chance for a reappraisal? And how do we make the most of that? It's such a good question. Um, I, I think, I, I hope so. And there, you know, I mean, the thing that we are constantly centering ourselves in, as many in the world are, is, you know, what are the new possibilities in this moment? And, um, you know, I hope that is one of them. I mean, it's, it's really like we've done a lot of reflection on, you know, what are we learning in this moment when school as we know it is on pause and we've kind of stepped out of the normal box. And one thing, and, and we've reflected a lot on like, is technology much more of an answer than, than we previously thought? And we think there's the potential for that, but if we're actually going to achieve equity 
and excellence in education, we're going to need a massive additional investment in, in technology because we're nowhere near all kids having access, even to low bandwidth solutions. But we will need to make maybe an even bigger investment in revolutionizing the teaching profession because differentiating teaching effectively and engaging kids with technology, honestly, we've seen it requires even more. Our teachers are working harder than they ever have. Um, so we will need to recruit and develop teachers very differently. And I think the only path to it, um, and, and I hope we have some lift with the cultural effect that you're talking about where all of us are valuing teachers maybe more than we ever have, um, at least those with, with young kids. Um, but I, I think we'll have to make a real choice as a society about where we're going to invest. And you know, I hope that we will center ourselves in the reality that we have not only a health crisis and an economic crisis, but an education crisis, a massive one. And that if we're going to ensure that we don't lose this generation, we're gonna to need to make some real commitments. Um, I think anything short of that won't take us where we need to be in terms of either the strength of the teaching profession or the strength of the technology solutions. Thank you, Shashank Tripathi. We'd love to hear from you and then Mayor. Shashank, please, if you'll come off mute. Yeah, hi, Wendy. Thanks uh, a lot. I have a question which is relates to your network and how you successfully expanded it across the world. I mean, you could argue there are three things which help technology, leaders and identifying them and understanding the context. What are those three or anything else really allowed you to make this beautiful network? Um, you know, at the start of this, we had a theory for how to maximize global impact. And it sounds really simple, but we've rooted all of our decisions in it. And it, I think, has proven to be pretty powerful, you know. And the theory was that we needed to have two things working together. One was local leadership, ownership, entrepreneurship. And the second would be a global platform to help those local leaders learn from each other. And the implications of that were huge, right? Like at every choice, like we actually, we don't go try to start up in a country. Like that's not how it works. People come to us saying, I really want to start this in my country. And then we come behind them and help them learn from other people's choices around the network, help them deeply immerse themselves in sort of the why behind our kind of network's purpose. And, and at the same time, so, so I think what's, what's enabled us to get here is sort of maybe a combination of, of the first two things you said in terms of, but hugely about leadership, right? Like it's about like, people who come to this and develop a deep rooted, you know, commitment to this particular theory of change in their countries and build really strong local contextualized rooted organizations, you know, and our ability to then learn from their innovations and spread them across the network so that we end up with kind of locally rooted and globally informed organizations and teachers and leaders, um, across across the network. Anu and Mayor, you had a question. Yeah. Wendy, you have been able to scale up to 54 countries, quality, good movement. Uh, in India, there's so much of inequity and most people have got used to it. And the migration problem has brought our insensitivity very much to the fore. Uh, do you have, through the Teach for India Fellows, how can we help many more people to be engaged and realize the country's problems? Like we also have so much social discrimination, inequity, corruption. So besides education, can our fellows be engaged in these things? and influence, how can they influence? And Wendy, if anyone can think of an answer, you can, because you're able to scale up so well things. Well, um, some of you may know that Anu is, or at least was for many years until very recently, the chair of Teach for India and is just an incredible force and ally of this movement, as well as her daughter, Mayor. Um, you know, um, 
gosh, how do I come at that? I mean, Anu, I think that Teach for India, you know, and, and the challenge, of course, is to do more and still better, but has been and is such a force in exposing to the country the inequities, you know, um, a diverse group of Teach for India fellows, some who themselves experienced the inequities and overcame all the odds um, and are now, you know, channeling their energy back into their communities. And, and then others who have experienced the, the privileges of India and may not have been so, so deeply aware of the inequities as you described, but because of their experience are gaining so much proximity to the issues. And I think what we see in India and around the world is that that experience leads folks to realize if we're really gonna solve the problem, we need to take it, we need to take all those different issues on. So I think about the alumni force of Teach for America folks who, who realized that. And you know, I think about you know, some of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement from DeRay McKesson to Brittany Packnett, um, you know, we're Teach for America alumni and are, are really, you know, leaders in the effort right now around, you know, addressing police violence and other forms of, of racial discrimination. There are many others from Clint Smith. Um, listen to his recent interview if, if you're interested in a much, just such a profound and beautiful perspective on this moment in our country. Um, you know, and many others, Morgan Dixon, who is leading the, the uh, gosh, I'm losing the name of it, Girl Trek, which has mobilized mm -hmm. so many African-American women to walk, you know, in, in solidarity with each other and support for each other and their health. And, you know, there are just so many different elements of this, of this challenge that the alumni of Teach for America are taking on because of what they learned mm -hmm. and gained to during their experience. And I think, you know, what you all are already doing and additional efforts to help the fellows of Teach for India reflect on their own privilege, you know, understand the complexity of the inequities that they're addressing and really reflect on what more they will need to do to tackle them in their full complexity. You know, you'll see these same effects over, over time. It just takes time and it's, it's such a long journey. Yeah, this is so much a huge part of what you're doing. It's, you know, what your teaching fellows do in those two years, but actually it's about what they do in the next few decades. Um, yes. So powerful. Now, I know we've got other people wanting to ask questions. Catherine, did you want to ask a question? I, I saw your raised hand. Yes, go for it. You're still on mute. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Wendy, thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear you. Um, I would just like to pick up the comment that really resonated with me regarding some teachers teach content and some teachers teach kids. And I loved that. Um, I'm a coach um, in the world. Um, and one of the things that I'm experiencing during this lockdown is the big messy problems that are in the world cause quite a lot of heaviness. And equally, I'm mindful that this is a time for maybe looking at how we engage minds through a lightness and some mischief and some joy. So I'd love to just hear you talk a little more to what has been your experience from the leadership that you have obviously, uh, your lovely essence that has woven its way across the globe. How do you um, engage minds and that sense of it's not always about the content. There's an interrelationship, but it's about engaging minds. And I love that engage kids rather than content. Thank yeah. you. Um, you know, one thing that we've been doing pre pandemic, thank heaven, um, you know, is really actually we've been redoing. I mean, for many, many years, we've studied the teachers who seem to be having the biggest impact on kids to try to understand what differentiates them. And a few years ago, we decided we had to redo all of these studies because the first studies were really looking at simply like which teachers advance reading levels the most, you know, um, and we, we learned a lot from those studies. But we've really oriented all of our work towards a much broader set of outcomes for kids in recent years. We had stepped back as a network and asked ourselves, like, what's the 25 year vision and thinking about where the world would be in 25 years realized if our kids are not essentially developing as leaders, 
who can reshape the world, you know, for themselves and for all of us. There's no hope for any of the things we're all working towards. And it led us to kind of orient towards a much broader set of outcomes for students, including the development of student agency and student awareness and various dispositions and values and, and the proficiencies that are also so important. Um, and, and we realized we needed to look at which teachers are actually holistically developing students and fostering their leadership and what's differentiating them. And we learned that it's a very different set of practices and perspectives that those teachers have. Um, so just to bring some small piece of, of this to life, I mean, it is so much about teachers who, who build strong relationships with their students, who are facilitating the students' learning, who are decentering themselves and holding the space so that so that they can kind of, you know, learn together. Um, and so then the question of how do we develop teachers who teach that way, like who teach very differently. I mean, this is, is going to be a big societal challenge in, in our view. Um, but we too in this era are thinking this is the moment. Like we've been asking ourselves, how do we foster uptake of this new framework for how teachers should be and how they need to be developed and we've realized this is one of the possibilities in the moment because never has there been more collective understanding that, I mean, what's enabling kids to keep learning wherever they're learning, it's because they are, they have some of these broader outcomes. They're owning their learning. They're, they have a, you know, they've been able to gain the supports to be in a solid place in terms of mental health and such. And so we know that's the only way they're going to be able to navigate the world too. So how do we, there's such demand to say, okay, well, so how do we foster these broader outcomes? And we're attempting to jump into the moment and um, help all these programs out there that are now having to train all their teachers virtually and such, just embrace this new kind of teacher development framework. Well, Thank well, you Beth, so much. I know you've been very keen to ask a question, go for it. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Wendy. Um, I had um, the opportunity last year to um, participate in uh, Latino Latino, which was the regional conference for Latin America alumni. And um, as part of Leaders Quest, we ran a workshop on um, personal energy and sustainability. And, you know, as you're speaking about this collective leadership and the just Mm. massive nature of the systemic um, challenges um, these alumni are tackling as many of them are looking at trying to you know overhaul the entire education systems in their countries um, and they're full of passion and you know the question we were you know running up against is how do they sustain themselves for the long haul how and so yeah. I know you've been in this for the long haul what's your experience been um, in, in keeping um, the stamina and, you know, how are you helping to instill that in the leaders coming out? Mm. We, we, I think this is so important for our leaders, first of all, and, and we're, we're experimenting with lots of different forms of leadership development in terms of trying to help them gain that space to really operate from their most conscious selves, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, it's such a fundamental part of the work. And actually it's a fundamental part of developing teachers who are doing what we need them to be doing with kids. Um, I think for myself, um, first of all, I feel really kind of privileged to be in a position that enables me to not only see the massive inequities and challenges every day, but to also I mean, I think I just have the ability to see the possibilities, like not a day goes by where I don't see that as hard as it is. There's also real evidence that we're making progress. You know, I'll watch the video of the teacher in Pakistan and think you've got to be kidding. Like how did this 23 year old woman do this? You know, or I'll see a community where there's a critical mass of these folks over time who have actually succeeded in affecting real systemic change with real consequences for kids. So like, I think being able to see not only the inequities every day, and sometimes I worry so much about our teachers who every day are, are in the face of such, such disparity. Um, 
you know, I think helping them pull up and see the possibilities, it's just been very important for me, I think. But also just personally finding the time and space. Like we have, I have a huge focus on personal space. Even in our organization, it's like we just have to protect people's personal space. I mean, their weekends, their, you know, we work so hard um, and we're, we're having to be so responsive to, to people all day long, um, but we just have to protect people's space so that they can reflect and be proactive and be centered in the relationships and other endeavors that they're pursuing and all. So it's been really important for me. And, you know, I think I always get the question, like, how do you do this with four kids and whatever? I mean, the four kids have been a huge source of my own sanity and stability <laughs> you know like they're the reason i don't i can't do this work every day and i think that's been so healthy you know wendy a final question i know we're nearly at time um my sense is here we are in 2020 the year has panned out so far very different than we all anticipated yeah. on the 31st of december um and I think there really is a sense that, uh, you know, and I loved, by the way, you know, I remember a couple of years back when you embarked on a 25 year strategy at a time when most organizations were feeling, gosh, I can't even plan six months ahead. So given what you do, you were willing to step right out there and think, uh, you know, what's our role over 25 years? Do you have a sense standing a few years hence from now? Um, do you think we'll be able to look back on this time as a time of really positive transformation that in amidst all of this mess, uh, you know, there's, tr there's real possibility to get our act together collectively and humanly. How, how excited are you by this moment? You know, here we are sitting in June halfway through um, yeah. a pretty extraordinary global year. You're, you're really getting that it's it's actually a puzzle that I myself and some of my colleagues are really grappling with right now um, because I think th that that is possible. Um, I think whether or not we can pull that off is all about our choices today. Um, you know, I think back to, and I, I this will, I don't want to, I know we only have a minute or two, but like, you know, I think back to Hurricane Katrina in the U.S., which was was such a devastating storm. And, you know, it's often thrown at, in, in education circles, thrown out as, well, they came back much better, right? Like the decade afterwards saw a true transformation. And I mean, nowhere near where things need to be, but truly a transformation for the outcomes of the kids of New Orleans. And I just, I, I, I was very close to that. And I saw what it took. And it took not just a few Zoom calls of people envisioning like, the future. It took a Herculean effort on the part of just hundreds and hundreds of teachers and, and education leaders from New Orleans and from all over the country, really, who went back to New Orleans and said, we will not come back the same. So I, I'm, I'm very daunted by that because I fear that I, I'm not sure I'm yet seeing the level of energy and commitment that I know it would require to actually come back better. And, and the problem is that one of the reasons is that the inequities that this has created or the, the devastation, I should say, that it's created, is so overwhelming. And so the same educators we need imagining the future differently are also the ones like just trying desperately to keep their kids healthy and and some semblance of learning, right? So like, I, I don't wanna ignore the fact that this is a very hard time. And yet I know this, I mean, we have stepped out of the box on so many levels, right? And, and we really don't need to go into the box again. And I just know that we need to really have that conversation with each other. Like, are we going to not go back into the box? Because if so, we need to really create a lot of space for that right now. Wonderful. Thank you. I mean, I, one of the things I'm very mindful of on these calls is, of course, you're talking to people across the generations who are listening now and also listening to the recording later, who are all super motivated to play their, their different parts in, in shaping a different future. So I really appreciate you, Wendy, giving us this, this time today. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody from around the world who's dialed in. We so appreciate having you all with us. Um, you're welcome also to send ideas for future leaders links. We'll we have some more 
sessions coming up through July. We'll take a break in August and then we'll, we'll be back in, in September. So really welcome gathering different amazing stories from around the world. Um, just by way of ending, I just want to remind you about our next episode. We, we take a break next week in honor of holidays, but on Monday the 13th of July, we'll be joined by James Harding, the former director of BBC News and Current Affairs and the former editor of the Times newspaper. Um, he's going to have a very delightfully off the record informal conversation with us about some of the global trends that he perceives are going on right now and why he set up something called tortoise media in a in a time of endlessly fast news cycles his belief which i suspect many of us would echo that a fast you know 24 7 news is doing us a disservice and we actually need to really pause and be more thoughtful including in our media so Please join on the 30th of July with James. In the meantime, big thank you to Wendy and wishing everybody a great rest of the day.